we've done this in the past, and depending on how it goes, Doug, we may do it again in the future. Not this election. <laughs> uh, we'd like to introduce Rob McFadden, who's running as a Republican candidate, and Sandy Haas, who's running as the Progressive. Tim Calabro, um, this evening, will be moderating the event. If you have not already turned in your questions to him, he will be posing the questions. If you have questions that come up during, um, just raise your hand, I'll come get your question and bring it up. I do have extra paper and pencils in the back. Um, but I do want to say uh, we've got a lot going on at the library this month. On Thursday evening at 7, um, we have an author event. She'll be talking, uh, reading from her new book on communes in Vermont, and she'll be reading the sections on Rochester. Uh, that is co-sponsored with Sandy's Books and Bakery, um, and that's Yvonne Daly, for those of you who know her. And then coming up on Saturday evening at 7, we'll be showing the documentary Denial, and Christine Hallquist will be here after the film to lead a discussion of the topics covered in the documentary. <laughs> So her time running a rural electric and the um, renewable energy projects that they took on, as well as her experiences as the first transgender um, CEO of a major corporation. So that's Saturday night at seven. So without further ado, Kim, you wanna take it away? All right, welcome everyone, thank you. Uh, I'm pleased to see we have a bunch of people and we have lots of questions submitted and I'm also happy to say that lots of them are already on the docket for my list here. Um, if by some chance we don't get to every single question, which I'm sure will be the case as the night goes on, there'll be some time afterwards to get together with, with uh, these two and, uh, and ask them yourself and get a direct answer from them. Um, so just so everyone's on the same page. The rough format to this tonight is we have a, a series of, looks like 16 questions more or less, uh, several from the audience. Uh, we're gonna try to keep the answers to those questions pretty tight so that we can uh, get, the, uh, get the candidate stances on these issues uh, without a lot of uh, lecturing back and forth from <coughs> the audience or audience to candidates. Um, and that way we can all get home and go to sleep at a reasonable hour too, which will be nice. Yes? Just a quick question, Chip. Those questions that may not get answered, mm -hmm. will we have access to what they might have been or are? Not sure. After? Yeah, sure. We can, we can make that happen, I think. Okay. As long as I can read all the handwriting, I think. Thanks. Sure. Um, so, why don't, we, uh, why don't we get right into it? We're going to, if we, just, we decided to do the, yeah. at the end. So we're going to do, instead of a, uh, instead of closing statements, opening statements and closing statements, we're going to get right into uh, uh, just a quick introduction from each of these guys. They'll introduce themselves, say who they are, and very briefly what their background is, and then we'll save um, more extensive remarks for the end before we get into questions. So um, who gets to go first tonight? You guys have a preference? I'll go first. All right. Is that okay with you? I'm Rob McFadden. I uh, live over in Gaysville. Uh, I've been there for 26 years. I uh, yeah, moved there from Ohio, and uh, Ohio is a good place to be from. I'm very happy and pleasant here, and pleased here in Vermont. It's been a great place to raise my kids. I've uh, raised two kids here. Uh, one's away at school with the University of Hartford for her freshman year. I dropped her off a few weeks ago. She's going back for her first time from college on Friday. Looking forward to that. I have a little uh, nine-year-old boy running around the mountains and swimming in the valleys and doing what nine-year-old boys do. Um, I've always been in sales. Uh, I moved up here with Cooper Tire and I covered the Northeast for them sales. And currently with Timken Aerospace, I'm an aerospace sales engineer. Uh, working for them and selling bearings into the aerospace and defense industry and precision control. Robots, an automation that's coming soon. Good. And uh, looking forward to taking this on. Sandy? Um, and I'm Sandy Haas. Uh, I moved to Rochester in 1980. 
Um, I was a, a sole practice, solo practicing lawyer out of my home, um, and we also had a bed and breakfast in our home. Um, so I practiced law for about 30 years uh, before I decided to run for the legislature. I was first elected in 2004, um, and I've been there since. Uh, I am currently the vice chair of the House Human Services Committee, and I've had that position for eight years. And I'm looking forward to running for re-election. All right, how is the volume, by the way, everyone? Can everyone in the back hear okay? All right, perfect. Can't hear? You must speak up. Okay. Should we run for the mic or should we speak loudly? I'll just speak a little we'll loud. Speak loudly. If you can't hear me, make sure you give, give me a sign. I'll... All right. So, here, uh, first question, and since Rob went first on the first one, uh, this one's for Sandy first. Uh, looking back at the previous session, uh, name a piece of legislation that passed that you support. And name one that you wish hadn't passed. That's uh, well, I, I, you always have to start with the budget. So you know that was we work. I, the, the biggest policy statement um, that was, is made in the legislature is where we put our money. So the, uh, my committee spends weeks looking at the things that affect uh, on human services that affect services to people in Vermont, and getting a budget passed is very important. Uh, what passed that, that I didn't like? I'm not sure that there was one. I, I could go back a couple of years and say Act 46, uh, which I, I fought. We fought it. We fought it when it came up the first time, and we succeeded. And then it came back again. Um, I think that Act 46 was um, was a, was an attempt to give to take care of school superintendents more than than students. <coughs> Uh, but it's the law, and we have complied with it. And I think we're finally, I think in this district, um, we, we're finally um, kind of settled in and people are moving forward. All right, well, same question. You want to repeat it or do you want to? Oh, yeah, I got this. Uh, I like that we finally passed um, legislation that quit making people that are using cannabis criminals. I don't like that it didn't have the rules for commerce laid out so the state could make some money that we so desperately need right now and create jobs. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail. But so I did like that they quit making people that use cannabis criminals. The medical cannabis uh, policies in the state are subpar. Um, so if you're a patient using it and you wanted to get what you needed, you, you were a criminal until this passed. Uh, so I like that that passed. I, what I don't like, I didn't like the uh, the Second Amendment modification that passed. Vermont doesn't have a gun problem that I've seen. I don't know why our legislature was spending time on that. We have so many other critical issues facing us right now. So I, I thought that was a waste of time. I think we stirred up a lot of people's emotions and further divided people in the state, and it just didn't seem necessary to me. All right, and, I, and all of those things will come up later. So I figured. Stay yeah. tuned. Um, and I should mention for people listening to this in the future, there will be a uh, recording of this on the Herald website, so I'm gonna keep saying each person's name. I don't think anyone would get them confused in the recording, but just in case. All right, question two, um, and Rob gets to start this one off. Uh, what kind of economic development does the state need, and what's the legislature's role in accomplishing that? Legislature's role in accomplishing that, I'll, I'll talk into that mm -hmm. first. Um, as the representative of a district, I think you have the responsibility to be in touch with the business owners, working to retain those businesses that are already here, doing whatever you can with the state and your connections in legislature to incentivize other businesses to come, know what's going on with all the businesses in your district and do what you can to help them and support them and bring them all together and bring in some of the ancillary businesses that will help the industry and the businesses that we have in the district. All right, Sandy. Is there a second part? There's a second part to the question. It was, uh, the first part was what kind of economic development is the state need? Uh, well, you kind of what, touched on that. Yeah, but what kind? There, there's this enormous opportunity sitting out there. We've, we've watched 
seven other states go in front of us. I have a lot of confidence in the people in Vermont to take what those other state, seven states that went in front of us and learn from it and apply the right legislation and the right rules of commerce for the cannabis and hemp industries. Um, we're doing okay on the hemp side of things. We went a little bit before this ag bill that just went through and, and we can see how a lot of the businesses here are doing well from it. Uh, you look at what Loose Farm's doing over there. And the number of hemp uh, licenses in the past year quadrupled and it's really starting to be a strong industry in the state. We could lead that. We could also lead the cannabis industry and we could do it right and we could do it wisely. We could learn from what the other states have done before and put the rules and the legislation in place to make it work right in this state. And we already have a brand. If you, you can't ignore that there's been a black market here for decades and decades and decades. We have a brand in that market already and it just seems silly that we have left it there and didn't get it through the last legislation, that last legislative session and taken advantage of it. This would fund the schools, this would help so many things in all of these districts that, we, that we're struggling with right now. And I'm confident Vermont could do it right, but it doesn't seem like everybody else is. All right, same, same question. Hi. What, what, what kind of economic development does the state need, and what's the legislature's role in the uh, Well, I believe that the best um, business for Vermont are, are businesses that are homegrown, um, that are, um, that are uh, birthed by people in this state. Uh, we have many, many, many innovators here. We have great colleges turning out people with great ideas. Um, and, and I think that the, the role of gov government doesn't create jobs. Government businesses create jobs. What gov government can do is, is make sure that we have the infrastructure in place that we need, the roads and particularly the broadband um, to, to um, allow commerce to happen all over the state. Uh, we have seen um, a huge growth in our uh, uh, breweries around the state. Uh, now there's, there are also distilleries around the state. And interestingly, there's a lot of work happening in the creative economy. There, there's a, there's a, we have a working group in central Vermont where people are coming together and they're not only collaborating on what they do, but also raising awareness to the rest of, the, of their neighbors about how the creative economy feeds and, and supports um, the growth of other businesses, the restaurants, the inns, the, the grocery stores, all of those things. Um, with respect to cannabis, you know, I, I have voted for commercial, for, for a legalized market every, every opportunity I've had. Um, it's, it's, it's a complicated question, and I think one of the things to keep in mind when we look at what the legislature did this last year is that with all of the issues related to, to cannabis over the years, Vermont has taken small, cautious steps. We started in 2004, was the first medical marijuana bill. At that time, the, uh, the commissioner of public safety was said, if you pass this bill, the, the health angels are gonna move into Vermont. And it took us a few years to figure out that that wasn't happening. So it got we, so we loosened it a little bit. We added some diseases. We made we let, let you have one more plant. Uh, and then in 2011, we we allowed dispensaries to happen. And we so we, we have gradually done that. And I see the bill that passed this year as as the first step. And yes, I agree with with Rob. It's wonderful that our neighbors are no longer criminals. All right. So there was. There are some questions in the middle here, but let me skip right to it since uh, marijuana is on everyone's mind. Uh, and this might end up being a short question because both of you guys have already talked about this a little bit. Um, but last session, Vermont legalized possessions of small amounts of marijuana, uh, but stopped short of establishing that regulated retail market. So what are your views on this uh, so-called tax and regulate system? Uh, for recreational marijuana, and I think Sandy starts this one off, right? Uh, so as I said, I, I, have, I have supported a tax and regulate system. Um, 
it's it's actually it's kind of complicated. There's a role for the, for the Department of Agriculture. There's a role for the Department of Taxes. There's a role for the for the Department of Public Safety. By the way, that's that is where our medical program lives. We're the only state in the country that has our medical program run by the Department of Public Safety, and it works. Uh, there's there's a role for the Department of Health, and so all of those pieces need to be ironed out. The states that have legalized commercial marijuana have done it by initiative, which means that somebody sat down and wrote out a bill and, and there were a bunch of billboards that went up and that was what passed. And that is not the way that we work in Vermont. We, we do things through a committee process where we get to hear from all of the players and everyone gets to weigh all of the issues and then try to come up with something that works for everybody. And that's the way I want to see us do it. Rob? All right, well, so here's talking about the government's role in business. Uh, they're, not, they're not creating jobs, but you know what they are doing? They're putting up barriers. Uh, that's what government's role in business has been. And these slow steps that you're talking about is exactly what we don't need right now. We're missing this giant opportunity. Every legislative session that passes, that opportunity shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. We were in a position where we could have led the East Coast on and, and done it our way. But with every time that passes, that opportunity shrinks and smaller and smaller and further from reach. And right now, I'm not confident it's going to get through this next legislative session. Um, I've got a YouTube video that I put out there, an ad about this. If you just search on my name uh, on YouTube, you can find it. But it's supposed to be a $50 billion industry by 2025, I think. And CBD is supposed to be a $22 billion industry by 2020. Why is Vermont afraid to go and take a leadership position on this? It fits into everything we do. You know, agriculture, we're great at that. Tourism, we're great at that. Craft consumables, I think it's what we're known best for. It's sitting there, but we just don't go. Government keeps putting these barriers in front of us. It would bring so many jobs to the state, and we could do it the way Vermonters do it, and we could do it right. We've seen the mistakes that other states have made, and we can learn from it, and we can do it right. And the slow steps thing, it's just not the way I work. I understand you have to work with government to get things done, but hearing somebody say, we gotta take the slow steps to get this done, at what cost? You know, are we really going to let this opportunity slip and let our kids keep leaving the state and there not being any jobs around here? So we can take these slow steps. The, the pitfalls do not outweigh the opportunity in my eyes. Um, it's just another missed opportunity. And I want to drive business in this district. All right. And get things going quickly. Not wait, not slow. And we, we pay for these reports on the state level, uh, the RAND report. And that RAND report says, move fast. You can be the leaders. But what do we do with that report? We're not moving fast. We're slowly, slowly, slowly prodding along to where we're going to end up with dispensaries every fourth or fifth town like a liquor store. And that's all we're going to get out of it. When right now, we can become leaders on the East Coast and attract that industry here. All right, that was a popular audience question as well. Um, I bet. Yeah. So let's uh, move back to the order here. And uh, Rob, you're going to start this one off. Uh, so Governor Scott has made it clear that he'll veto budgets that include increases in taxes or fees. How long is that a uh, sustainable strategy? Do you support it? And if so, where might there be room in the budget to find savings? brought this cannabis industry and hemp industry in here, we would be able to fund the social programs and the schools uh, where our tax dollars are going. We could create a new revenue stream for the state in taxes that people would come from out of state to get involved in our cannabis and hemp industries. But got to take it slow, I guess. I, I know we need this here. I, every, people I know are struggling. Um, and they're working free jobs, but if they're 
car breaks down in the middle of winter, it's going to impact their entire family. I, I just, we don't need to live like this. There, we need to be more business forward. Well, let me let me pull you back to the first part of that question there uh, about the governor uh, vetoing budgets that include t increases in taxes and fees. Is that we can't just, afford any more taxes and fees. We, we just can't. Um, we can't. I don't want my property taxes going up anymore. I can't. I have a good job, but I struggle. It's just like we're surviving here, not living. It, it's. I'm fed up with it. And no, I don't want to see any new taxes. All right. Same question for you. So, we have a lot of services that we are providing in Vermont that we're not doing the job that we need to do. Whether it's whether it's um, our mental health services, uh, our um, child child care. We have we have a crisis in the child care area right now because. The subsidies, the, the subsidy is only available to a, a small percentage of parents who, who have to work. And the consequence of that is that the kids are, are, are home with, with some neighbor who watches television all day. Uh, and therefore, they're not ready when, when it's time to go to school. This is, this is we've had, we had a Blue Ribbon Commission look at this. There are, there are many areas of state government where every year we say, oh, we can't afford to do that because, because we, can't, we don't have the money. We can't afford to do this because we don't have the money. And to draw a line in the sand and say, we won't even consider trying to figure out how to, how to provide better services, as far as I'm concerned, is not responsible government. Uh, with respect, to the, fee, the fee issue is particularly interesting because the way that we do fees is that is that fees fees are supposed to pay for the program. So, for instance, if we're talking about uh, uh, the um, inspection of bed and breakfast, which I was, then 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 the licensing fee is supposed to pay for the people who come to the door. If you get to a point where it's not paying for it, where the program isn't paying for itself, then it's not working. And we had a program before this governor, we had a program where every year we analyzed some of those fees and we said, okay, is it pay, is how, how, what's the balance between the expense and the income? And sometimes we reduced the fee because in fact, we were getting more in that program than we needed. So the idea that we can't even look at those anymore and make adjustments that reflect the cost of the program is, is a really good soundbite, but it's terrible policy. All right. So we're getting to another audience question now. Um, and this is, uh, Sandy gets the first shot at this one. Uh, what will you do to ensure that we get better cell service and I would add internet to the uh, district? We talk about this every year. Let's see, Governor Douglas promised that we would get better, that we would have broadband all over the state by, I think it was, uh, it was 2006. Um, that worked, right? Uh, what I can say, what I can say locally, is that we've been really lucky to have EC Fiber. Um, it was it was too bad a few years ago when the um, when the U.S. government um, decided to give all of the money to um, Vtel in Springfield and not to EC Fiber here. But they they managed to come up with some funding now, so that they are in fact rolling out to, to all of our towns. Um, we. All I can tell you is that we talk about this every year. We tried that was we tried actually this year to increase the service, the universal service fee to put some money into this, and that did not get get past the governor. I mean, one of the things to keep in mind with all of these questions about where we might go is that we have a governor who's saying no. So, for example, the the you know. If we wanted to talk about tax and regulate marijuana, the governor has said he's not ready for that. So if we can we can spend three months on a bill and send him a bill, and if he vetoes it, that's the end of the story. So we, without the governor on board, um, we don't we don't have we don't. It's not realistic to think that we're going to move forward on this. And I, I want to be a little bit. I think we. I think we need to be careful about how we look at the potential revenue from a, from a, a tax and regulate marijuana system. Um, number one, you want to keep the tax low enough that you actually kill the black market. If the tax is too high, 
then you're gonna have a parallel black market going at the same time. The second thing is that so there are some expenses that are built into the tax and regulate system. There are people that, if we're gonna have the, the product inspected by the Department of Agriculture, they need to have they need to have money to do that. So some of the some of the revenue that will come in will actually be taken by the program. And to be honest, the big pressure right now for for any extra money in that uh, in that revenue stream will be to expand our opioid treatment to to to, to add it into things that relate to drug drug use prevention by children, uh, highway safety, and um, uh, treatment for people who are addicted. Okay. Rob? I'm not sure what that had to do with expanding cell service in our district. Uh, but here's the thing with the cell service problem. Consolidated, Fairpoint, Verizon, they had to take Vermont as part of the New England deal. They don't make any money off of our individual homes. Uh, that's why when you need service, it might take you a month. It costs them money to serve us. We're a lost leader for them. The only thing that's going to bring that here and good service here is industry. If we don't have some businesses here, successful businesses insisting on it, where these companies can make money, the communication companies can make money, it's not going to come. We, you know, as residents here in this rural community, it costs them to send us service. Until we have business here and the towns are thriving, this, this is what we get. Um, fortunately, we do have EC Fibernet, the group of Vermonters that put it together, and put their minds together to, to solve a problem. And, you know, it's coming, but not enough. Uh, you know, I went for a month without any, the month of August, I had no phone, I had no cell phone, I had no internet in my house. And that's all right when this happened. On primary day, they said, Rob, you want to be, uh, you want to run for the house? I had no communication at my home. Uh, so that, that's a big thing for me too. But we're not going to solve it just by complaining. Unless there's some industry and businesses here where those companies can make some money, it's not coming. Uh, well, I, I can then go in a little bit to the cannabis part of it, like Sandy. That's some of the business that would bring the communication services and companies. Some industry that we just don't have here. Stony Brook Tavern, they're closing. They're done. Uh, uh, tomorrow, tonight's their last day. At their peak, it's 20 jobs. And good paying jobs. It's one of the restaurants that paid well. They're gone. They can't, it's not sustainable by the number of people we have here. The winter they had to close down, they'd have to completely get a new staff every spring. So it's just done. Another business just going away. We have to do something to address this, or we're going to be left with moose and squirrels and deer, and, and that's it. And if you've been paying attention, the squirrels are already trying to take over. <laughs> All right, this next question is uh, was submitted by Harold Reader, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a little specific, but we're going to try to draw on that a little bit once we get through it. So the, the writer asks, employees working for any of Vermont's 15 parent child centers earn about 30% less than state employees in comparable positions. Um, could you support an increase in the uh, parent child center's master grant to begin to close this gap? And I think the broader question is, how does that how does pay equality fit into the, uh, into the state government role? So you mean the existing pay gap right now for state employees? So this, this reader is particularly interested in uh, employees at parent child centers in Vermont who apparently are making much, much less than similar positions in, in state government. So those pe people are state employees? That's my understanding. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why we have so many state employees. Uh, it's our biggest employer here in the state. Can't uh, can't the market? Can't we do that? Can't that be private businesses? I, I just don't get it. Why that's the responsibility of the states? If it wasn't there, then some businesses could pop up. And we wouldn't have to worry about the disparity in state 
funded jobs. It should be the private market doing those things. When I talked earlier about the pressures on the budget every year, the parent travel centers are, are one of the groups on the list. Um, they are the people who work with children who might go into state custody and end up in foster homes um, where the parents are, are troubled and need some help. Um, it is an area that I would love to see us put more money in. We haven't been able to find it. Um, the disparity between our private community contractors and state workers is an old story. When I was a board member on the Clara Martin Center 25 or 30 years ago, um, I sat down with Senator Edgar May to say that basically the same thing. Well, our people don't make as much money as, as people who work with state government. And, and Senator May looked at me and said, yes, that's why we contract with community providers. So, you know, there is, there is, there is, um, there is some thought at the state level that it's more economical to, um, to work with folks at the local level. I actually like, from a, from a community standpoint, I like the idea that we have local people who are working with, with, with their own local problems um, and, and then we try to find ways to, um, to, to bring in state funds where we can to help them. Um, but I don't, think the, I don't think the pay disparity is ever going to go away. Um, I do hope that we can increase our, our allocation to the parent child centers. All right. So we have another uh, question from the audience. And uh, Sandy starts this one off. Um, do you believe that the current property tax structure is regressive, and and why? And what specific changes in the property tax structure could you propose to make it more fair? Well, I have supported uh, trying to to get to get us even more on uh, the have property tax be much more based on one's ability to pay. One of the things that we see right now is that with respect to education, um, the people at the highest end of the income spectrum, spectrum excuse me, um, pay uh, as little as 1% of their income to support the next generation. And people, middle income people pay 3%. And that doesn't feel fair, it doesn't feel equitable. Um, and it's not good for our children. So I would like to see us move to a system that is more reflective of people's ability to pay. Uh, we had a bill uh, that tried to do that this year um, that, we, that we passed out of the House. The Senate didn't like it and we never saw it again. Um, it's, I confess that it's a complicated question, um, but I think it's one that we need to keep working on. All right, well, you want that again or you got it? Well, we're talking about people's ability to pay, so you know that sounds good on the people that don't have the money to pay for its property taxes. Um, they would take a large share, but that means people that are successful are then they have to pay a much larger share, and, and I'm not sure that's right. Um, if you look at Colorado right now, their schools are overfunded, and it's because all of that money is coming from the cannabis industry that we should be moving slow on. I, I just don't get that. Why should we be moving slow? We have seven states have gone before us. We can do this. We can fund our schools. That's where the biggest part of our property taxes are going to, is the funding the schools. We can fund the schools through this. I don't know why we're hesitant to bring this revenue stream to the state. All right, this is one of my favorite parts. When this is, we have a lightning round here. We have four questions, and, and each person is going to answer those questions in just a sentence or two, and we'll speed right through this. So Rob, you get to go first on this one. Uh, there's a proposal to phase in a $15 an hour minimum wage by 2022. Uh, do you support such a measure? I haven't been comfortable where to put my flag on that one yet, but I would rather see it be market driven. I would like to see businesses competing for employees. Ready? Uh, I voted for the bill that we passed last year. Um, I, I support moving to a $15 an hour minimum wage. I would point out that the bill that was um, vetoed by the governor would, would have taken our minimum wage from ten fifty right now to $11.10 in January. I think that's a modest increase. All right, next question, Sandy. Name one policy area that you believe has not received enough attention. Probably 
probably probably figuring out how to do a better job with property taxes. All right, Rob. Uh, the opioid issue that's facing the state. We're not doing enough, and I think it's another place where Vermont could lead. All right, Rob, this one's for you. Uh, do you support implementing a carbon tax this session? Can anybody here afford a carbon tax right now? Sandy? Uh, I believe that any, I believe that climate change is, uh, is a pressing problem and that we need to address it with a regional solution. So, no. Not the, no carbon tax session. Got it. Uh, Sandy, this one's for you. Name a candidate from another contest that you support for election this year. Uh, Senator McCormick. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to say Wayne Townsend because he's uh, the one that talked me into doing this and because he's here. I was going to say, <laughs> Okay. So that was, that was the uh, lightning round. So we're going to move on to uh, next question, and Rob starts this off. Um, schools are, for the most part, settling into their mergers, and at the same time, they're uh, beginning their proficiency-based graduation requirements. Uh, what, if anything, should the legislature focus on next with regards to the education system? Uh, I think the supervisory union should be consolidated, like the schools with them. It's a shrink a little bit. Too much of the education budget is going to the supervisor. Um, in response to a constituent that I had a long talk with the other day, um, I believe that we need to require civics education as a condition of graduation. All right, this is another audience question here, and Sandy gets to go first on this one. Um, so, uh, staying in touch with constituents is vitally important. Uh, how will you keep people informed and make sure you remember to follow up on their concerns? Uh, so I, I have um, my email, I have two email uh, addresses. People write to me regularly. Um, I do my email about six o'clock in the morning and I respond to uh, everyone who, who asks for a response. Not everyone does. Some people just say, I want you to know how I feel about this. Well, so this isn't lightning. This isn't lightning. Yeah, you can go on for a little while. All right. Uh, so when I first got uh, this write-in and this nomination, I started a Facebook page, and the first thing I did was saying, "What are the big issues facing this district right now?" And I got a pretty good response. I had 26 responses, and that was really right when I started. And they listed everything down there, and. Um, you know, keep keep in touch through there. My phone number, my email. There's only four thousand people in this district, um, but I'll talk to me if you want. <laughs> Hopefully, not all at once. Yeah, not all at once, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm all about keeping in touch with everybody. I don't want. I'm not a party guy. You know, I was. You know, I guess I'm, I'd say I'm fiercely independent. Um, so when I was written in, they said, "Would you do this?" So I had to consider my job. Um, and then they said, are you going to be okay with an R next year, Dave? So I had to think about that, too. Um, and then I decided, I am going to be representing this district. I'm not bringing any of my personal policies in. You know, I'm divorcing myself from those to represent this district. So I want input from everybody. So I know how you want me to vote when I'm in there as your representative. I don't want to vote along party lines. I, you know, that's not the way I want to do things. Like, you know, you can vote along party lines, and it can be idyllic and for the good of the state and for the good of the country. That's not what this district needs right now. We need some action on things right now. It goes above and beyond these idyllic party uh, issues and what the state needs. We need to focus on what this district needs right now. Okay. Um, this is going to be a fun one, I think. And Rob, you get to start this one off. What improvements are needed for the uh, Vermont health insurance system? I don't know. I don't use it. Tackle health care. Yeah, let yeah, me take care of health care. Um, I don't know. I don't use it. And this is a, I'm not a politician. This is my first foray in it. So I don't know every issue. 
up close uh, for some, and that's one of them that I don't know a lot about. But I do know that the more the government and the state is involved in an insurance program or any sort of program, I think the more messed up it's going to get. I, you know, I really think insurance for all is a great idea. I have zero confidence in the state or the country leading that successfully. You know, we, we screwed up, the government screwed up a gas stop. I can't pour gas from the, any of the new gas containers right now without trying to figure it out. I, if they can't do that right, I really can't expect them to do healthcare right. Thanks, Andy. What are your insurance healthcare things? Well, I am happy to report that I am uh, uh, entitled to Medicare at my age. Um, and as I believe many people in this room might be, you might not want to admit that. Um, and I've been very happy with that system. So when, when people talk about what we can do, I think, gee, that's a system that works. It has a, low, it has a relatively low overhead, amazingly enough. The administrative costs are low. Um, the service is good, and uh, and it and it works in our local hospitals. Um, what I what I what I hear from businesses is that they that that every year their premiums go up. With well, the current system doesn't work. It's it, you know it's we we've, we've tried various things with private business, and it the notion that you're gonna that you're gonna have companies competing with each other over what kind of policy you should buy, you don't find out that, the, that you got the wrong policy until you're lying on the pavement um, and you discover that, that you can't get the service that you need. So having a single, a, a single system that everyone is part of, like Medicare, I believe is the right way to go. All right. Uh, Sandy, this next question you get to start off with. Um, for several years, the state's been sending a number of inmates out of state to commercial pr commercial prisons. Uh, is this an adequate response to crowded prisons in Vermont? And if not, how can uh, the state better address that issue? So I've been a member of the Justice Oversight Committee for several years now, um, and we talk about this all the time. Uh, one of the things I can report is that we have reduced the total number of people incarcerated in Vermont significantly over that time. The, uh, we had a study done by uh, an outside group that showed that we could we could expect the prison population to be increasing, and in fact, we made it decrease. Uh, we have, I think, the number is um, 1,600 beds for men in the state right now, and um, and I don't support building any more because what I want to see us do is actually reduce the number of people. We had thought we had up to 700 people going out of state uh, at the beginning of the, the, this century. Um, and now we're down to under, under 225. And we, we, continue, we continue to find strategies to divert people from the system entirely. People with mental illness don't belong in prison. They need a different system. People with addiction don't belong in prison. They need to, they need to be treated. Uh, people who have served their minimum sentences should, should be released. People who are awaiting trial, unless they're dangerous, should be, should be at home and working awaiting trial. If we do all of those things, we can bring that number down. If we build new prisons in Vermont, we will, we will, fill, we will fill the beds. It's like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. So I truly, I truly resist Adding to, our, adding to our capacity, I think the answer is to figure out how we safely reduce that number to a, to a population that we can handle. I don't like private prisons either, um, but in fact, uh, that, that is, I see that as the pressure valve that keeps us, that keeps us working on reducing the total prison population. All right, Rob? One of the biggest drivers of my life is to strike out injustice. Nothing turns my stomach more than that. And the thought of a prison for profit just, uh, it's just unbelievable that this country would have a prison where they had, how many, they have a number, they have a quota of how many people they have to have in there. You have a contract with the state and they say, okay, you have to fill this many beds. That, the injustice in that is, is mind boggling. I do not support private prisons in any way uh, for whatever reason and I am with you on reducing the number of, of incarcerated um, 
the, the entire country is incarceration crazy. I, I, I don't know if this is right. I, I read this. I didn't completely know. Is it true that Vermont has more people in prison than Canada? <laughs> I have not heard that. Since yeah, I, I read that. I, I didn't vet it, but I, I doubt it's true. But Canada's a big country. Yeah, Canada's a big country. But you know, we prison so many more than the rest of the world. It's uh, it's kind of crazy. And the thought that there is a prison profiting off of that, and it, yeah, I, I cannot support that in any way. And for so, whatever reason. As far as uh, thoughts on changing that, I guess you did mention the lower number of incarceration. Okay. All right. Uh, Rob, you get to take on this uh, next audience question here. Um, this is a gun safety question. Uh, the past uh, legislative session, Governor Scott signed the law, the most far reaching gun safety legislation in Vermont history. Um, <coughs> What are your thoughts on this reg on this legislation? Uh, why do you support it, or why not? And uh, what, if anything else, needs to be done to address gun safety? I'll be quick. Vermont doesn't have a gun problem. I don't know why we're wasting time on it. Sandy, uh, I supported the uh, the bill that was signed by the well. There was actually there were three bills that were signed by the governor. Uh, there was the um, the extremist protection uh, order bill. And the um, and the bill that allows um, the police to take guns and very briefly in a domestic violence situation, um, but but the bill that everyone talks about um, S55 had four uh, provisions, um, all of which I supported: banning bump stocks. We all know that in um, uh, Nevada, if the um, if the killer hadn't had had hadn't been using a bump stock. That more people would have been able to escape, so that would have, at a minimum, it would have reduced the carnage. Uh, background checks, uh, adding, requiring background checks for all gun transfers makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know how many how many people in this room uh, followed the story that Paul Hines did a couple of years ago, where he went online in the morning uh, looking to buy a gun, and by the end of the day, he was standing in a pizza pizza delivery parking lot, um, buying an AR-15 from someone, and he didn't even have to give his name. Um, so that, to me, makes some sense. Uh, increasing the age to 21 for the purchase of guns, with an exception for people in the military, people in, in, in law enforcement, and anyone who takes a, a hunter safety course. That, to me, is a sensible rule. Um, again, with, mag with, with magazine limitations, once again, you're talking about how do we reduce the carnage? So, so do mass killings happen? Yes, they do. Was was there possibly going to be a mass killing in Vermont this year? We believe so. We have we have lots of evidence of that. So, number one, you reduce the possibility the the possibility of an event happening in the first place. And if, if an event does happen, these provisions reduce the carnage. All right. Uh, next question, Sandy gets to start off. Um, so a commission is currently evaluating Act 250, uh, which is Vermont's long-standing uh, land use law, which I'm sure everyone knows already. Um, do you feel that that law's regulatory role has been generally positive or negative, and what changes to Act 250, if any, would you support? Uh, I have always supported Act 250. Um, I, I think we I think we see it we all see it in in our neighborhoods and, and what it's done with in terms of, of concentrating uh, development in our downtown areas that's that's what's made Rochester strong is that we have everything the big businesses are downtown um, the it, it has had an effect all over the state in terms of, of how we allocate our, our resources between business and, and open land and keeping our forests strong. I'm sorry, I, I lost, you lost me. What do I, do I like it and? Yeah, uh, do you, let me find my question here. Do you feel that its role has been <coughs> largely positive or negative and what changes, if any, would you suggest? Okay, so, so there, one of the things that's important to know is that, that I think it's 90% or 95% of applications are granted and many of, most of, there's a huge percentage, I think it's about 80% are granted without even a hearing. So if the, the law works, 
Um, I, do, do we need to tweak it? I don't know. I will wait to see what their, their, their report says. But in general, I think it's done a good job and I want to see it continue. I will agree with you. We do all see it in our neighborhoods. We see our population being reduced by 25% since 2000. Um, we see businesses leaving. We see businesses being opened and not being able to be sustained. There is a place for it. Um, it's too restrictive right now. And even, you know, I, I put on that Tweed River Music Festival that was over there at the junction of 100 and 107. At 250 was trouble the entire way through. And this was for a weekend music festival. It's too overreaching. Um, I agree it's done some good things, but is New Hampshire that much different than Vermont? A lot of ways, yes, but is it, you know, changing the way things look and the way people live? And they don't have an Act 250 like this. It's really getting in the way of progress and, uh, and business, and we so desperately need that right now. I want my daughter to come back after college if she wants to move here and be able to make a living here and afford a house here if that's what she chooses to do. Right now, four years from now, I have zero confidence that she could move back to this district and find a job, afford a house, or even just to rent it and be able to pay back her student loans. Zero chance of her doing that. And uh, I think Act 250 and the restrictions on business are part of that. So I think Act 250 needs a leash. All right. This is a, a, a reader submitted question. And it, uh, the, the question is how do you feel about um, public funds paying for private schools for students? And the reader was specifically asking if you know, the Sharon Academy, but I think it applies broader than that. And it uh, looks like Rob says as well. Uh, you know, school choice. I'm okay with it. Um, and you know, more importantly, is everybody here okay with it? If I'm going to be representing you, I'd want to hear from you on that. But yeah, supporting the, the um, private school, I'm okay with that as long as it's not too much and uh, as long as the fees aren't too much more than what the fees would be for each student for one of the public schools. Um, you know, I'm there in Stockbridge and that's a big expense and a big drain on the town right now but it's you know, you know it's necessary there and I'm glad it's there and a lot of kids that have come up and been brought through that and I'm part of the PTO and I go to all the events it's, it's a good thing but our property taxes are so high if we could just find a way to fund these schools I'm a strong believer in public education I think it's it's the foundation of our of our democracy um, and I'm very happy that we have public, public schools in, in at least three of the towns um, that I represent. Uh, but I do see a role for the Sharon Academy in particular. Um, I, I had a friend who, when she was about 10 years old, was, was really a troubled child. And frankly, I think, I'm not sure that she would have, I'm not sure, sure, sure that she would have even made it through school. Um, and. And she went to Sharon and she became a star and went on to college and is now off in the world being successful. So I, I, places like Sharon Academy have a role for kids who need something special. Um, this town voted um, to, to join with Stockbridge. We made a choice a year ago to, um, to give up our high school and let our, let our children go where they want. I've been talking to those kids. And they're very happy with the place with, with the placements that they have. So we have we have kids in Sharon, we have kids at, at Woodstock. Um, it's the the way the funding structure works, um, the tuition to Sharon actually probably maybe maybe less than the tuition to Woodstock. So in terms of economics for for the for the local taxpayers, um, it's it's not it's not it's not a drain. Um, and I think that there's a place for both for both kinds of schools. All right. And this is this is cut our last question for the night before uh, before closing remarks. That went fast. Um, so there's a sense that progress on the state's goal to have 90% of its energy come from renewable sources by 2050 seems to have stagnated a little. 
Uh, what can the state do to get that back on track? Um, and is that a worthwhile goal to begin with? And uh, it looks like Sandy's darts this one off. Well, given the report that came out yesterday from the UN on um, uh, the state of the global climate, I, we have to stay with the, with, with the goals that we have in the state, and we have to figure out how to get everybody on board, not just, not just with laws, because not everything is done with laws, but, but with public opinion and working together with other people. Um, you know, we, we passed a law a couple years ago about, about, about idling. Um, I don't think anybody even knows about it. I, I walk by and I see people who, who have left their vehicles idling for 10 or 15 minutes. I don't know, I, I don't know how people can afford to do that for a start, but it's, 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 it's terrible for the environment. It's not, it's not helpful for the vehicle. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do as individuals to begin to take some steps. And I think that the gov that, that state government through, through our state plan needs to keep the pressure on to move forward. We, global warming is real and we need to address it. Well, yeah, I'm okay with incentivizing people to make some switch, you know, make some changes and uh, go to some cleaner energy sources, but I'm not okay with penalizing people for using what they have and with the proposed carbon tax. Uh, and, that, that seems crazy to me, um, punishing somebody for the heating system they have in their home right now, or their car that doesn't get great mileage. Uh, you know, uh, maybe that's all we can afford right now. Um, so, yeah, if there's incentives to go to green energy, we'll call it, great. Penalties for not being there yet, I won't support and As far as that being a worthwhile goal to be 90% from renewables by 2050. Is that a year? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's something to work towards. Um, and, you know, with each five, ten years that go by, check where you're at and see if it's attainable. You might have to move the goalposts a little bit. Something to work towards. All right. Well, thank you guys for bearing with me for all that. We have uh, just a, a little time for you guys to make some closing remarks and uh, bring up any, any topic areas we may have missed or come circle around to something else. Um, and based on our order, it looks like we all get to start this one off and then... Okay. Um, let's look we'll to see everything we, we touched here or any questions. Um, well, one of the things I want to announce is I'm uh, kicking off a district business leaders forum. And next Wednesday, the Clear River Inn and Tavern has agreed to host it. And between now and then, I'm going to contact all of uh, the business owners and the business leaders in this district and invite them there where I want to hear, I want to find out what we're doing well, what we're struggling with. What are, what is the town, what are the towns and the state helping these businesses do? Where are they getting in the way? What are we going to have to do to retain the businesses that are here? I don't want to see another Stony Brook Tavern that's paying well, closed, and there'll be 20 people out of work. Uh, you know, what, what do I have to do to retain and support the current businesses? Do you imagine if GW Plastics left Buffalo, like Vermont Castings did, and like Stanley Tools did in Pittsfield? What happens if GW leaves Bethel? We need to focus on how we retain these businesses and how we attract more and some ancillary businesses that are going to help the current business structure we have here in the district. Uh, so I want to go and I want to do everything I can and off support the current businesses, bring more here, bring the right ones here, and I'd like it to be prosperous. I don't want to see my neighbor's car break down and have this life of that. Uh, I want to see people have nice gifts under the Christmas tree. I don't want people to take nice vacations. I want people to live here, not just survive here. And you know, I've got the experience to do that, I think. Uh, when I got this nomination, I said, what can I do? What can I bring to the district? And I had to be something worthwhile in order for me to do it. And that's what I can bring. And I want to kick that off by having this business forum next Wednesday. Um, it's not just for the business leaders, it's for anybody that's interested in it. Want to just get us all together and decide how we're going to go forward. And also, after this, 
uh, the folks over at Doc's Tavern were uh, nice enough to open up. Um, usually they're closed on Tuesdays, but I'd like to invite you all over there if you'd like to talk some more and ask some more direct questions of me or just sit down and have a beer and listen to some music. Uh, <clears throat> hope to see you over there tonight and at next Wednesday's, Wednesday's event at the Clear. And spread the word on that if you would to any of the business owners. I'm getting out there as much as I can, but uh, you know, it's eight days away. And do the best I can, but spread the word while well, us get there. And thanks for coming here. And I want to say special thanks to everybody that's been helping me on this campaign since it kicked off. Uh, they're here. They know who they are. Thank you, everybody. So first I want to say thank you to the library for having us here tonight. I think this is a great, great opportunity. Um, and thank you, Tim, for, for your hard work as a moderator. Um, I have been honored to, it's been, it's been a great honor for me to serve in the Vermont House for the last 14 years. And I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm asking for your support for my re-election. Um, I want to go back and keep doing the same job. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy the work and the issues, and I really enjoy representing this community and the three other communities in this district. These are all communities that care for each other and create things together. As a member of the legislature, I've really appreciated the chance to, to be a collaborative problem solver. I love, I love solving problems, but, but in fact, we do it better together. And as vice chair of the Human Services Committee, um, I've had a chance to be, be very much involved in that. When we, when we have something before us, we look at the issue, we analyze what the, what the current law is, does it work, how doesn't it work, what can we do to make it better, and with 11 people in the room, all from different backgrounds, different philosophies, different political parties, we come up with solutions to things, and the product is always better than anything that any one of us could have, could have done on our own. I've, over the years, I've developed good working relationships with members of, of all parties in the House and with members of the administration. I've served on several special committees looking at, at different issues, from access to hospice and pain management, to marijuana legalization, and to, the, to safely reducing the, po the population in our prisons that we talked about. And I'm proud to bring your voice to all of those different issues. Whether you're voting now on, or on November 6th, I hope that you will send me back to Montpelier. Thank you. Thanks everyone for, uh, for coming out tonight. If you, if you guys are willing, we'll have a few minutes for everyone to mingle around a little bit and ask some more questions. And, uh, good luck both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.